Hello again, I'm Jane Rongren. Welcome to the today's presentation. I'm the Community Relations Director here at Lake, uh, the Lakeshore. We are so honored to have with us one of our colleagues here at Era Living, Joan Retman, who is the Area Community Relations Director. And she's going to be presenting a very beneficial informational uh, seminar on evaluating retirement living options. She's done this several times uh, and she's very knowledgeable and we're very fortunate to have her with us today. So thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you, Joan, and I will turn it over to you. Okay, Jane, thank you so much. I'm gonna pause for just a second while I now, sh I now share my screen and then we'll go ahead and get started. So bear with me for just a second on that. Okay, there we go. Looks like we're up. Okay, great. So hello, and thanks again for joining us today. Again, my name is Joan Retman. I'm the Area Community Relations Director for Aero Living, as Jane had mentioned. Uh, Aero Living is the owner and operator of the Lakeshore, our gracious host for today's event. As an Area Community Relations Director, my role has been primarily to help families discover if an Aero Living community may be a good, for, a good fit for them, as well as to mentor and to support other community relations team members within our company. I feel it's really been an honor for me to serve in this role and other similar roles for other organizations over the past 13 years, as it's quite rewarding to me personally to help guide someone when making such an important decision, helping them find the best fit, even if it's not the fit within the community where I happen to be working at the time. Today, however, I'm going to be wearing a little bit of a different hat, although I'm still wearing my Air Living name badge that you can probably see on the computer. Today, I'm not here just to share an overview of the differences between retirement communities, but we're also gonna be talking about uh, some important things that I've learned over the years that to me feels like there's missing information at times from the decision-making process. And some of these things you may not necessarily have even realized might be important to consider. So we're gonna dive into that a little bit. So my hope for you today is to gain knowledge of how to best compare your options and to ulti ultimately make sure that you're choosing the best community to match your particular situation. Uh, so once again, we'll hold questions until the end, but you can go ahead and put that in chat at any time to prepare, prepare for that. And we do have a lot to cover, so we're going to go ahead and dive in. So you're welcome to follow along on the screen. Uh, you might have received this information in advance, so you could take notes on that. If for some reason you're missing a copy of this presentation, or if you're calling in on the phone, this is information that can be um, mailed to you, so you have a hard copy of all of this as well. So what we're planning to talk about today uh, includes talking about some of the different senior living models that are within this area. We'll talk about the financial contracts that are involved in those, as well as the different types of care options in those, the pros and cons of each one, and different considerations to factor in to make sure that you're making an informed decision. But we'll also talk a little bit about how you know that it might be the right place for you and if it's the right time for you. So within senior living models, there, there's quite an assortment to choose from. And if we would wanna get into details of everything shown on this list, we would probably have needed to block out an entire afternoon to cover all of this. So for today, we're really gonna be focusing more so on options as they relate to independent living and assisted living specifically. So that includes terms that you might have heard, such as just retirement community in general, or many of you have probably heard the terminology continuing care retirement community or CCRC, flex license. I bet that one might be new for you, so that'll be fun to learn about, and assisted living. So let's start in with talking a little bit about just the term retirement community and what that means. That's a very general term that you'll hear a lot in this industry. It doesn't really give you that much information because you can't tell just based on this term whether that might include communities that offer care or not. The term retirement community 
originally you could say was really meant to refer to communities that really are age restricted. So ones that might be 55 and older, 62 and older, 65 and older are probably the most common ways of classifying that. The intent is that by having an age restricted community, you have people of, of similar age and interest living in similar environments uh, to be able to participate in those activities, making it easy to connect with others, having social interactions, but also minimalizing some of the other things that may have been taxing in life with a lot of the maintenance and responsibilities that can be in place when you when you own um, your own home typically. There are different options in this area where you may still purchase a, a town home or another property within a retirement community like this, or sometimes there are, are apartment options or others available as well. If we look at the type of retirement communities that are really classified for those that are maybe 55 and older, so a younger demographic, those rarely are the types of communities that offer care as part of it. So they're simply ones that are meant to be age restricted without care services built in. Communities like this are, are very advantageous, oftentimes as a first step in the process, but not necessarily the last move that somebody might make. Um, we talked a little bit about some of the points already listed on the screen about having the opportunity to live around others of similar age and interest and how easy that makes it to get together for social activities. It oftentimes gives one's family a lot of peace of mind too because they're not worried about um, living in a home alone so much or, and taking on all of those responsibilities. So what could potentially be viewed as a downside to this option um, would be access to younger generations. This actually isn't necessarily exclusive to 55 and older communities, but oftentimes it's something that pops up in all kinds of retirement communities, generally speaking. A lot of times there are questions asked about what types of intergenerational programs are offered, if any. I don't necessarily want to just live around a bunch of old people. We hear those comments a lot. Those are a lot of um, questions that come up sometimes when folks are touring with us. And so my, my comment to that would be not to necessarily postpone moving into a, into a retirement community of any sort because of fear for that without asking more questions to that particular community about what types of access there might be. Um, there are a lot of various partnerships that happen and I will say during normal times, during COVID, uh, it's a little bit different now with restrictions. And I'm sure there might be some questions that pop up towards the end of this about that. Um, sometimes there are daycares that are part of communities, which offers a wonderful opportunity for unique uh, interactions with those of various age groups. Sometimes it might be inviting the, the Girl Scouts in to have regular meetings there. Other times there's partnerships with various schools to allow for specific interviews and interactions that happen directly with residents living in those spaces. So there can be plenty of opportunities if, um, if those communities are participating in that way. But one of the other downsides specifically to the types of communities that do not offer care that might be um, geared towards a younger demographic within seniors is that there is the, the likelihood that care services will be needed in the future. We do know uh, statistics tell us that at least 70% of us will need some sort of care at some point once we you know, reach the 80-ish year old time frame or so. And so for some people that need might be great enough to, to need to move again to find the right support. For others, it might be bringing home care into this type of environment. But for many people who move into an option like this, another move might happen again in the future. And if that happens to take place because of a health crisis that might happen rather suddenly, if you have, have bought in to a retirement community like this, there might be the possibility that you're really relying upon the funds of, of a house that you've purchased or another type of property that you've purchased to pay for the cost of care in a different environment, sometimes that can put you in a little bit of a pinch if a crisis happens and you really are relying upon those 
uh, funds quickly, therefore waiting for the sale of that to happen can, can sometimes be stressful depending on what the market is like. But in the Seattle area, fortunately, the real estate market seems to be continuing going strong. Uh, even during COVID circumstances, COVID has affected a lot of us negatively in a lot of different ways, but the real estate market in general has remained strong here. So if you're not familiar with these type of communities that I've been describing, the 55 and older ones, perhaps you've heard of Providence Point, a well-known, very large community that's in the Issaquah area, or Shag. There are um, advertisements on TV quite a bit for those locations all over the place. Trilogy is another large community around the Redmond area. Revel is a new-ish company in the area that has some newer communities being built. If there's Revel Issaquah, which is one of their newest locations that uh, has actually just recently opened within the past few months. So now let's switch over to talking a little bit about a CCRC or a continuing care retirement community which now there's a new term thrown in to describe this type of a community, which is called a life plan community. I think one of the things that makes this process of looking at retirement communities somewhat complex and challenging is the ever-changing terminology that's used to describe various types of models and such. And life plan sounds very close to life care. So I'm planting that seed now because we're gonna be talking about life care communities very shortly. Life plan is different. So life plan and CCRC is essentially the same thing that covers several different kinds within that. So we'll get to that in a second. But when you look at a continuing care retirement community, there, there's a clue in the name there, continuing care, which tells you that care is definitely part of what's offered there. To be a true CCRC, you would normally see four different types of living situations. There's independent living, always. Assisted living, always. Most of the time, there's skilled nursing as part of it. Memory care was not necessarily part of the original CCRCs that were built 50, 60 years ago, but it is now very common to find memory care. So, a CCRC at this point in time typically includes all four of those. And they're all in a different space within the structure itself. So independent living you would typically find in physically in one part of the community or the building. Then assisted living exists in a different place, skilled nursing and memory care and so on. With a continuing care retirement community model, Usually the, the age restrictions or age demographics are starting at a little bit of an older um, uh, starting point. So not 55 and older or 55 typically, but starting at 62 or 65 and older is where uh, CCRCs typically start. The services that are included within a CCRC tend to be a little bit more robust including not just maintenance like you might find in just a, a straightforward retirement community, but usually there's housekeeping services that are offered to, which maybe include housekeeping once a week, uh, maybe it's once every other week, depending on the community. There's usually pretty robust dining options available, which might include one meal a day. If you're moving in as an independent resident, it could include more. It might be related to meal credits instead of number of meals. All the programs are set up a little bit differently, but it's usually a, a significant part of what's offered. Transportation is almost always part of what's offered too. It may or may not exist for a fee, depending on the community. And the idea behind a CCRC is that if the, the model is working like it's intended to, the idea is that you move into independent living to start, and then as you need the various types of care that exist in that community in the future, you then move out of your independent living apartment and move into the appropriate next step. So it might be a different apartment in the assisted living section or maybe skilled nursing. Maybe it's temporary for skilled nursing if it's due to rehab or something of that nature or memory care. These care levels that exist in the different part of the community, depending on the size of the independent living, may be reserved 
exclusively for the independent living residents to utilize. For some of the CCRCs that are designed with larger healthcare centers that contain the various other levels of care, they may offer some of those spaces to those who don't live in the independent living. So you might be able to move directly in um, from the outside, possibly. With the CCRC, normally there's a buy-in involved. So I'm sure many of you have probably heard the term buy-in or entrance fee. Those are typically, I would say, similar to if you were to purchase a house or a condo in the Seattle area. So it could be common to find uh, entrance fees that are 200000 400000 even all the way up to over a couple of million in the Seattle area, depending on the community. There's some, uh, some newer CCRCs that have been built within the past 10 years, very luxurious and are, are on the higher end with that price range. With the entrance fee that you pay, it's very common for there to be a refundable component to that. So commonly, for instance, you might see that 80% of that entrance fee that you pay is intended to come back to you personally if you leave the community or come back to your estate at some point in the future. But there are some other options that, depending on the community, may or may not be available with alternative refundable options, like a 50% one, or even amortized, where at some point you would not receive a refund for the entrance fee that you've paid. It amortizes down over time. Typically, the, the smaller amount that you would be intended to get back would mean that you would pay a smaller entrance fee going in in the first place. So that's why someone would maybe choose that option if that's available. So now let's talk a little bit about these different kinds of CCRCs or life plan communities. There are really three different types. And this information, if you're curious to learn a little bit more about it, you can do more research online too if you'd like. And you can actually type in type A, type B, or type C communities. And we're gonna dive into each one of those today. So the type A is the one that we're gonna start with. And you might remember a minute ago, I mentioned the term life care, not to be confused with life plan. So life care is specifically attached to the type A model. That's speaking differently than life plan, which encompasses all of the CCRCs. So life care community specifically is one where you move into independent living just like you would with any CCRC. But if at some point in the future, you then move to one of the higher levels of care, again, in a different part of the community, the idea is that the rates that you had been paying while you were independent essentially follows you to whichever care level that you need, which means that you generally pay the same cost, whether you're living in assisted living or memory care, as you might if you were to need skilled nursing permanently. And that can be pretty significant because you know, I'm not sure if you're familiar what the, what the going rates, what the market rates might be in the Seattle area for skilled nursing, for instance, but it's not uncommon to see anywhere between $12,000 and $15,000 a month for skilled nursing. So if you had been living in an independent living apartment in a community like this and you moved to skilled nursing, maybe you were paying $4,000 a month for one of the independent living apartments there. That's a big difference in terms of what the, what the cost might be. But the key is that you need to move in soon enough before you have certain pre-existing conditions because essentially this is like buying a long-term care insurance policy is one way to think about it, which protects you from those market rate costs. So this, this type of program can't be available for everybody uh, because it wouldn't be a financially viable model for the community if they did that. So you need to be able to pass their admission criteria to do it, keeping in mind that there are certain pre-existing conditions that will likely disqualify you, and think about those as ones that are very likely to need long-term care in the future, such as any kind of a dementia diagnosis is likely to disqualify you because it's very likely you might need additional support, likely memory care, or sometimes other diagnoses like Parkinson's or MS, multiple sclerosis, might also be a, a reason to be disqualified because of the likelihood that you might need uh, care in the future. 
if we look at how the type A model or life care compares to moving on to now type B, which is also known as a modified contract, they're very similar um, because the, the care levels are all there and you are likely to have admission criteria to meet there too, meaning you need to move in while you're independent. But if you move to a higher level of care in this model, the biggest difference is that there's some sort of a limit to the financial benefits that are attached to it. And they're not all the same. So this is where I think it's especially important to read the contract to find out which care levels the discounts apply to and for how long you get those discounts. So for one community, for instance, maybe you move into assisted living and for the first two years of living in assisted living, you would be getting a discount off of the market rate, but then after that, it jumps to the market rate. Or maybe it's a certain number of free days that you might have where you're not paying anything at all additional for the care in that particular care level, maybe 60 days or something like that. And then after it expires, it jumps to market rate. So uh, those are a couple of examples. Just make sure you ask questions to find out um, which benefits apply to which levels and for how long. I'm gonna jump back for just one quick second because I wanna make sure that I'm uh, sharing examples of these communities, especially for those who are on the phone and listening and not able to see these slides. If we backtrack for just a second and go back to the type A or life care model, if you're curious, well, which communities in this area offer the life care plan? There, I listed two of them on the screen here, but I'm gonna read them. Emerald Heights in Redmond is the oldest life care community in the Seattle area. That community has probably been around about 30 years or so now. Timber Ridge at Talis is in Issaquah, and that community was built, I wanna say about 10, 12 years ago, around the same time that Skyline at First Hill opened, which is not written on this slide, but that is the third life plan or life care community in this area. The only other one that I'm aware of that's anywhere near the Seattle area other than those three is a, is a newer one called uh, Heron Key, and that's in Gig Harbor. So aside from those four, you would then automatically know that, okay, I'm not looking at a type A life care community. It must be a type B or a type C, which we'll get into in just a second. So with the type B community, a couple of examples of those would be Mirabella, which is also a newer community that opened around the same time as Skyline, Timber Ridge at Talis. A lot of communities opened around that time frame. Uh, Park Shore is another example, um, a very well-known established uh, community that I wanna say has been around for probably about 55 years, maybe closer to 60 years now. Uh, in the Madison Park neighborhood right on the right on the um, right on the lake Lake Washington beautiful so now to to touch on what a type C community is this is also known as a fee for service model and most of the other continuing care retirement communities in this area fall in this category like the Hearthstone Bayview Manor would be a couple of examples of these and the, the idea here is when you move from independent living to one of the other care levels that they have in place, you, you would switch to market rate. So the contract's really, really very clear and straightforward. You pay market rate, but how this might be different than say a type B or a type A is typically you are paying a smaller entrance fee when you come in. They're typically not priced quite as high. So that might be the reason you would choose a type C over the others is because even though you pay market rate in the future, there isn't as much cost upfront going into it. So now let's look a little bit closer at the different types of pros and cons when you look at a CCRC or, or life plan community. The, the benefits that stand out, one of them which is very obvious is this gives people a lot of peace of mind with all of the various care levels that are available. So it feels good to, to think, gosh, if anything ever changes for me in the future, I've got all the care needs right there as part of the same community if I ever need it in the future. You do have priority access to this. So should the community offer these spaces available to folks from the outside, 
those who live there in the independent side are always going to have priority should there be an opening. We talked a little bit about the financial benefits already, um, which can be really wonderful. There's an additional bene uh, benevolent fund that is available in many CCRCs, not all of them, but in many of them, which means that if you run out of money at some point in the future, the community will agree for you to continue to stay there. And I made a note on here that you must qualify for that. And what I mean is that when you move into a type of community that has a buy-in option, usually there is a requirement for you to disclose financial information to make sure that once you move in the very next day, you don't run out of money and <laughs> put, this, put the community in a, in a difficult situation. So they're gonna be, have requirements for you to have a certain amount of assets before moving in. And the contract will also read that you must be responsible with those assets after you move in. So you're not, you wouldn't have the ability to say, gift those funds away to, um, to your children or do other things that, um, that would jeopardize um, having those assets in the long, in the long term. And so sometimes when, when this information comes up, I know sometimes families express some concerns thinking, well, how, how responsible is it for a community to offer this? That sounds wonderful, but what if half the community runs out of money? How are they gonna keep going? I think it's important to know that the financial requirements before coming in are, are pretty significant. This really is pretty safe for communities to offer because there's so much um, cushion, if you will, that they ask for that it's extremely unlikely that somebody would um, would get to that point of needing to use that resource. Um, but it, it still feels very lovely to have that offered in the contract, just in case something changes that's out of your control. And then um, one of the things that we'll talk about shortly would be month-to-month -month communities, but one of the benefits when you're comparing the, the large buy-in models compared to month-to-month -month communities that that do have upfront costs, but it's, it's very small compared to the buy-in, is that when you're comparing the monthly fees from the buy-in models or the CCRCs versus month-to-month, -month, is that the entrance fees mean that you're gonna be paying usually a much smaller monthly rate when you're comparing, let's say, apartments of equal size or close to it. You'd be paying less for one of those in a, a buy-in or a CCRC compared to a month-to-month. If we look at maybe some of the disadvantages of this type of model, there are some really important points that I wanted to address in here, again, based on some of my own personal experiences and what I uh, came to realize from working in a CCRC. This was actually how I got my start in the industry about 13 years ago, was working in a, a type A type of community actually. And I was part of the startup team there. So it was under construction, brand new, lots of excitement around it at the time it was being built. It was, it was fantastic. And I remained working in that community five years later. So you can imagine when people are moving in in their 70s and 80s, fast forward five years, a number of those folks had some health changes that happened over time, which meant that you know, again, remember with the model, you're supposed to, you're intended to move from that independent apartment to a higher level of care. Yet when a number of residents were faced with making that decision and making the move, there were, there were a, lot of, um, a lot of people that were resistant to doing that because one of two things, it meant giving up let's say their 1400 square foot beautiful apartment that had this amazing water view to move to an apartment in a completely different part of the community that was maybe 500 square feet. And they were used to, used to this space, but moving to a smaller space was just very hard for them to, um, to wrap their minds around. But it also was diff difficult for couples in particular because that does mean the idea is that you separate at that point in time, that one person moves to the higher level of care while the person who's independent is meant to stay in the independent apartment. When it came down to making that decision, that was really difficult when people were faced with, with that. 
this point about the, the guarantee for the higher level of care, I think it's important to keep in mind, but I also don't want to cause you distress by mentioning this because it's not common for somebody to not be allowed to move into a higher level of care. But I do think it's important to know that if you move into the independent living, into the independent living side of the community, it doesn't mean that with 100% certainty, you can move to a higher level of care if you need it in the future. And the reason why is because due to the licensing that is in place for the healthcare side of the community, there still needs to be an assessment that happens by a licensed nurse to confirm that that level of care or part of the community can appropriately meet your needs. It's going to cover most situations that, that you would be fine with, but once in a while there's something that pops up that makes that makes the situation especially challenging for that community and they, they may have to say no. And during my time in, in working in this particular um, model, I did see that happen once, which is why I feel it's worth talking about. And that was related to certain challenges related to behaviors with a particular gentleman who had progressed into later stages of dementia. He was living with his wife in independent living it was time for him to make the move, but he actually did not pass the assessment in this particular community because of behavior issues and needed to move to a different community that had a higher level of support around that. So it's something worth giving some consideration to. One of the other things that was hard for some people to, when they made that transition is that, you know, remember that these, these residential operations are, are segregated within the community. So that sometimes would mean that moving from independent living means also giving up the, the dining that is t attached to the independent living or certain activities or certain common areas that are specific to the independent side of the community. So when moving to, say, assisted living, it meant a, a different dining room, uh, different neighbors perhaps, different friends, uh, different activities. and it. it to some people felt like they really were actually moving into a completely different environment, even though owned and operated by the same group, even within the same building, if that makes sense. A couple other comments would be just your personal preference on, on paying that large amount before coming in. Sometimes folks are resistant to wanting to do that when they may feel that, you know, gosh, all of that, that money, that 800,000, I could put that to work in my own way under my own control versus the community using that money. Because again, keep in mind that when you pay an entrance fee, you don't, it's, it's not an investment. So it's not where you're going to receive interest off of those funds should you move out in the future. Those funds are in place for the benefit of the community, which is in part what keeps your monthly rents lower in an environment like that. Something that's not always obvious to everyone is that should for some reason you move out of the community and you want to move somewhere else, that refundable portion that is in your contract is not a check that's written to you on the day that you move out, but rather it's refunded to you typically when the apartment you had been living in is re-rented to the new person and those new entrance fees come in, a portion of that would be the refundable portion that goes um, back to you. So. Again, I don't think that's really anything to worry about in the Seattle market typically because you know, even in retirement communities, much like real estate, things tend to move fairly quickly. Um, but perhaps in other parts of the country where the market is a little bit different, that might be one to be more concerned about. We talked about the pre-existing conditions piece already that that might disqualify your ability to move into um, a community. But we're gonna talk a little bit about that more in a second from month to month as well. The last point that I just want to highlight on this is that sometimes um, sometimes there are families that look at the CCRC model thinking that I'm really not comfortable seeing walkers and wheelchairs and I want to move in around those that are just really independent and that's where I want to be. And I think that that is something you're more likely to experience in maybe a, a brand new CCRC, that's just being built. And so a lot of people tend to move in when they're on the younger side. 
uh, and likely aren't needing ambulatory devices like that, which, which for some people uh, they're worried about. But if you think about what happens over time, remember these devices are ones that really do help people continue with their independence. So it is likely that you are still going to see um, walkers and such on the independent side of the community, especially if somebody decides that they are not going to move on to the assisted living side as they had thought that they might because they're, they're wanting to stay living in their independent apartment with the amenities and the views and such that they, they bought into in the first place. Sometimes family members in that situation actually choose to hire home care and stay in that independent living apartment instead of moving over. So if that happens, imagine how that may potentially change the, um, the vibrancy of the independent side over time. It essentially is, is blending assisted living with, with independent living, only the, the care is provided by an outside service coming in as opposed to the staff within the assisted living part of the community. Now let's talk a little bit about a flex license model. And what I, what, I'm, what I really enjoy talking about with a flex license model is a little bit, of the, little bit of the history, which is specific to Aero Living, which is one of the reasons why I'm so proud to work for this, with this company with a lot of the innovation that comes from the connections that Aero Living has. And one of this relates to the, the relationship that we have with the University of Washington. Without going into too much detail at this time, essentially the flex license evolved because when Era Living began over 30 years ago, they quickly developed a relationship with University of Washington School of Nursing and retirees from the University of Washington to, to partner to talk a little bit about what do, what do seniors really want in the, the ultimate design for a community? If, if they could build it, what would it look like? And a lot of the response was, well, we would actually prefer to not move as much, even within a community. So is there a way that we could uh, create an option to move into an apartment independent, and then if something changes in the future, just stay right there and have the care come in? And that's what a flex license is all about. So here, you move into a apartment, and then at some point in the future, if you need help with medication management or dressing or showering, you don't need to move to a special part of the community. All apartments can either be independent or assisted living uh, at any point in time. There usually is a number attached to that community. Like each community has a, a different number, such as you know, 40% of the apartments might have the ability to be licensed for assisted living, for instance, or it varies just depending on how many assisted living um, licenses are purchased for that community. So they're all gonna be a little bit different. But these communities, most of the time, are month-to-month -month options. There are some exceptions, but you're not paying a large entrance fee or a buy-in typically for this type of model either. Uh, it's a community fee, rather, which is oftentimes comparable to maybe one month's rent or less, maybe a little more, just depending on the community that you're looking at. There are still admission requirements for most of these uh, communities. So when we were talking about pre-existing conditions and such before, these flex license models tend to have looser requirements than that, but they may require that you still need to be independent at the time that you move in. So perhaps you have a Parkinson's diagnosis, but you're, you're early on in your diagnosis and you're still independent, that will be fine. You won't be disqualified from a flex license model where you might from a CCRC. That is also determined in the assessment process as part of what you would want to discuss, but it is one of the benefits. There's a little bit more flexibility there. Normally with a flex license model, um, you typically have more independent living residents in this model than those that are needing assisted living because there are admission you know, requirements to be on the independent side or close to it before moving in. So needless to say, era living communities are part of this. But since then, many other companies have evolved and have uh, used this model largely like Merrill Gardens communities I uh, use flex license, uh, leisure care communities. So those would be communities like Fairwinds, Fairwinds of Redmond, Fairwinds of Woodenville, 
Uh, the Chateau, which is also very close to uh, the Lakeshore's location, is another example. Looking at the pros and cons of a flex model, of course, a lot of people love the idea of staying in the same apartment rather than moving, but it's also very inclusive in design. So there's one dining room, all of the activities are available to everyone, whether you are an independent resident or assisted living, you don't have the, seg the same uh, segregation that you might find in different design. You can, you're also welcome though to stay in these apartments um, through end of life and have hospice uh, come in through any of the apartments in these communities. One of the downsides to a flex, li flex license model would be, as we talked about, you might have a higher monthly fee that you pay. So if you move into a flex license uh, model at a very young age, over time, it's possible you may end up spending more than if perhaps you moved into a CCRC with the buy-in, but a much smaller monthly fee over time. The care limitations are something that, that might be a factor depending on the community. Because the models generally have more independent residents than assisted living, usually the assisted living capabilities are a little bit lighter than you might find in a different type of model, perhaps one that doesn't do independent living at all. Um, and so those are good questions to ask, especially if you have certain pre-existing conditions where it's likely that you're going to need very heavy care at some point. It might be good to know that if you move into a model like this, there's a chance you might have to relocate in the future if you have very extensive care needs. Um, or if you are not, if those care needs are not in, are in your near term future, it might make sense to focus on a, a different model because your stay in one of these might be shorter than you would hope. Let's talk just briefly about what assisted living means. We've been talking along the way about things like medications and dressing and such. Those are referred to as acti activities of daily living in this industry. Assisted living, as we talked about, can be paired with independent living in a flex model or part of a CCRC, but you can also move into an assisted living community that just focuses on assisted living, usually paired with memory care. With those models, assisted living is very different than in a flex model. So the admission criteria is quite different. You can usually move into the community really at any state of need rather than a requirement to be on the very early side of care. And the, the staffing might look different there too, because again, you don't really have many independent living residents living in this type of an environment. Nursing hours can vary, although it's uncommon some communities that are fully licensed for assisted living that skip independent living might actually have 24 seven nursing care. It's not common, but there are a few of those out there that provide that because they are capable of doing a very heavy level of assisted living, almost bordering on skilled nursing in some cases. With these different models, if you're looking at one that's fully licensed for assisted living, versus moving into a community that is under a flex license that has assisted living available. You might also notice a difference potentially in the type of activities that are offered as oftentimes retirement communities try to match the type of activities to the residents abilities and, and interests. So for communities that are fully licensed for assisted living, it's really common that cognitive impairment might be a piece of what the needs are, why that person is moving into a community. And so if you're someone who's very independent and vibrant and lectures and seminars that are um, that involve a lot of conversation and engagement is really important to you, comparing a flex model to one that's fully licensed for assisted living, you might see very different types of programs in that sense. Um, so for communities that are fully licensed, where all of the apartments are automatically licensed for assisted living, and there's not really a focus on independent living, some examples of those communities in this area would be Sunrise, uh, Aegis. These are uh, companies that have locations all around the area, so I'm betting you've probably heard of them before. Or Patriots Glen is an example that is um, pretty close to us in the Bellevue area. Let's talk a little bit now about the most overlooked considerations. And 
I won't read through every point here, but there are a few that I want to highlight because they um, they really have stood out to me over the over the years. And even though I've touched on this already, I think it's worth saying again because I feel like um, you know when I mentioned at the very beginning that a lot of times there's missing information when people are making decisions about moving and timing to move. Most people seem to be lacking knowledge that pre-existing conditions and admission criteria is a big factor. So for, for a lot of people who say, you know, I, I love the community, but I really want to wait until I can't take care of myself anymore, until I can't take care of my home or physically, I just can't manage myself anymore. That is fine if you are only focusing on the models that let's say are fully licensed for assisted living and are bypassing the independent route completely because those that do offer that independent approach usually have admission criteria which means that it's very likely you might miss that window where you can't move into that community at that point in time where if you would move in ahead of it and then age into more of those types of care needs you're fine uh, so the timing piece of it can be really important and of course, if we had crystal balls, it would help make the decision a lot easier to figure out that timing. Um, but others do it just as part of the planning process to get ahead of um, risking missing that opportunity. With local owners and managers, I would just mention that sometimes when they are two different parties, sometimes that can potentially mean with changes that might happen in the future. So let's say an owner decides they want to discontinue a management contract with a different company and move on to another. That could mean staffing changes. It could mean a change in the types of services that are offered. And that may not be a bad thing. That could be a good thing potentially too. But I think it's important when you're looking at communities to ask a few more questions about it to say, are you both locally owned and managed? If the answer is no, just to simply ask, how long have each of those been in place? If there's been a change recently, maybe ask a few more questions to find out how long maybe the former management company was there, how services have changed or how the staffing has changed over time to get a sense of the stability of it. Um, so again, change isn't always a bad thing, but sometimes it is a reason to ask more questions uh, to make sure that if you move into a community like this, if it's prone to change, uh, management companies in particular, you you run the risk of maybe not getting what you signed up for years down the road when the next change happens. I'm going to touch on state surveys very quickly because a lot of folks don't know that these exist. So when you are a community that's licensed to provide care, the, the state of Washington is, is one that comes in every 12 to 18 months to do inspections essentially of each of these communities to make sure we're all doing our jobs. So they look at a number of things, care related, the condition of the community, they talk to residents to make sure all the boxes are checked and everything's going well. And there's a report that's generated to share that information. Um, so this is information that you can, you can ask for in any retirement community that's licensed to provide assisted living uh, in the state of Washington. They are required by law to be able to provide, to provide a copy for you uh, when you ask for that information. And it can give you some good insight um, if there are some problems that you're seeing there or ideas um, for other questions to ask there. I think, you know, to skip down to the, to the last point on this slide, I feel like this one is worth spending just a moment on too because when when you're comparing, let's say, a, um, a continuing care retirement community to the month-to-month -month models, a lot of times I would hear uh, working with families that a, a CCRC is what they want to focus on simply for the reason that they don't want to move more than once. And that was the, the top thing on their list. Sometimes initially it was until we would talk a little bit more about what was important, but oftentimes that, that comes up early in the conversation. And so I think that that very well may be the, the perfect fit um, for you, but it may not be for everybody because if you are moving to a CCRC only because of that reason, but let's say you visited and the activities 
don't really feel like uh, something that you connect as much with, or maybe you've had a chance to um, meet a lot of the residents and maybe you don't have as much in common with, uh, with the group that lives there as maybe compared to say month to month communities that you've been looking at. The food is okay in the CCRC, but you love the food in a different location. Uh, that's a month to month. Let's say the month to month is located just exactly in the location of other things around the community that you want to go to independently. And maybe the CCRC that you're, continue, that you're considering does not, but it's got all the care. So therefore I'm gonna focus on that. I feel like it's important to, to think about it just a, a little bit deeper. And remember that if you start out in independent living in a CCRC, you actually do have to move. So remember, you move from that apartment to a different apartment. The move does happen. And remember, depending on the design of the community, it could feel like a completely different, a completely different setting anyway. So if you're thinking about moving again and you're comparing say moving it from a month to month community potentially to one, a different one in the future due to needing a higher level of care. But then you also have the choice again of finding the, the perfect community for you when you need that higher level of care. Is there, wh what, is, what is more important to, uh, to be in a community where you might move 500 feet down the hall if you need higher care or living in a month to month where maybe you're moving two miles down the road to a different community. Either way, you're moving, but if your journey along the way is a better fit in one or the other, maybe that's a clearer way of looking at it before making that decision. We have a couple more slides to um, go through. So we have a few minutes left, so I'm going to um, touch on the, um, the timing considerations really quickly. But just, just to touch on this slide really quickly about other considerations, if the financial component is one that you really need to focus on and you need to look at um, income qualified types of options or perhaps Medicaid, which allows for you sometimes to pay privately initially for a couple, uh, couple of years, but then uh, they call it a spend down program where after that point in time, Medicaid picks up on it. There, there are less options in the Seattle area than I would like to see for those. So investigating those early in the process would be, I think, very helpful to do if that is um, where your needs are. And, you know, unfortunately, it's, um, it's challenging for, for a lot of communities to participate in these types of programs because uh, so many communities really strive for offering the, the most vibrant programming and, and excellent in those areas, dining as they can. And the reimbursement rate is so low with Medicaid oftentimes that they choose not to participate in those programs because they wouldn't be able to offer, offer the same service level. So options in the area are pretty minimal with those, but you can, you can always check those out, hopefully ahead of time, because sometimes there's also very long waiting lists to get into those because they are um, somewhat limited. So to talk just very briefly about how do you know if the community is the right fit for you? So I've learned all this information about different options, but how do I know if it's right for me personally? I think one of the points I want to mention is that a lot of times a question comes up about, well, what's the average age of your residents? How old are people that live in your communities? And I think that is definitely a question that's worth asking, but, but to take it one step further, and to think about what, what information is that really telling you? So for, for some communities, you might have an average age of 89 years old, but maybe it's in a flex, a flex license model where almost everybody moving in is very independent. So you might have an incredibly dynamic and active group of 90 year olds or 89 year olds that live in that community, apologize for that. Uh, versus a community where maybe the average age is 70, uh, 70 year olds, but if it's a community that is focused more heavily on the assisted living support and maybe doesn't offer independent living, that community may not feel as dynamic and as engaging because of the, the focus on care that's there. So it's important to dig a little bit deeper rather than just talking about the, um, the age group there. 
asking about care limitations is important, especially if there are certain pre-existing um, conditions that you might have. But one of the biggest points here to understand if the community is the right fit for you or not is especially if you're looking again at, at CCRCs, to make sure that you visit all of the care levels that are there before you make the decision. And that way, if you move into independent living and if at some point in the future, the need is there for you to move to a higher level of care, that you're familiar with it and that you've checked it out and that you're comfortable with it uh, so that you feel good about making that transition as opposed to feeling very, very stressed about it or feeling like you need to find other resources to stay in your, your independent side. Uh, and then lastly, just talking a little bit about if it's the right time for you. You know, this is a checklist of questions that I think is good for you to, um, to just kind of process on your own time and think through a little bit to kind of reflect upon and evaluate if you're, if you're in this situation, comparing how your life has been within the past five years, if you've been starting to see some, um, some changes, do you have certain pre-existing conditions like mild cognitive impairment that likely points towards needing uh, care in the future? How is your social life? Which is actually a, a pretty, pretty significant consideration during the times of COVID, uh, where a lot of people living at home alone right now are feeling especially isolated. It can be a problem during non-COVID times, but now even more so and moving into retirement communities even though restrictions are in place due to COVID, there are still a, a lot of ways that residents can be connected with each other and staff during the, these strange times that we're in. Uh, how is your diet? If you move into a community, having all of the meals in place to offer that support might be something that feels really good. But also if you've had any health scares recently, that might give you an indication that it might be time to think about um, making the move before maybe another crisis hits or something more significant happens. So if those things are something that um, that stand out to you, that you've experienced some changes lately, it might make sense to um, consider moving or feeling, feeling lonely. Um, if you just have anxieties about the what if and you're someone who really likes to plan and have a plan in place so that if something changes in the future, that you, you're in a place that can offer support, it might be the right time to think about moving then. So let's go ahead and um, move this over to the time to have an opportunity to ask some questions. So in a second, we'll get to that. I think what we'll do first to give everyone an opportunity to maybe type more questions into chat if you haven't had a chance to do that yet, is we'll have uh, Jane or anyone else from the Lakeshore jump back on here uh, for a couple minutes to maybe talk a little bit more about the Lakeshore specifically, which I'm sure some of you have visited, um, and to talk a little bit about how the Lakeshore might tie into some of the information that we just covered today. And then we'll circle back to address the questions right after that. So uh, Jane, I'm gonna go ahead and um, stop sharing my slide here so that we can have you take over the screen a little bit more if you'd like and um, and tell us a little bit about the Lakeshore. All right, um, great. Thank you so much, Joan, for, for kicking this off for us. Um, great information as always. And um, right now I don't see any questions in the chat, but while I'm talking just a little bit more about the Lakeshore, feel free if you do have some questions to type those in or we will unmute everybody when I'm done here also, so that if you just would like to ask the question to Joan, we can do that as well. Um, but many of you uh, have perhaps visited the Lakeshore. You've been in this beautiful dining room that I'd love to say I'm sitting in right now, but I think the, the blue water and the blue skies kind of gives it away that with modern technology, it uh, places me in the, the dining room, but it's really not there. <laughs> and, and you can see in Lisa's video, she's in the front of the the community as as well here at the Lakeshore. Um, but for those of you who are less familiar, I'd like to share with you a couple of things about our retirement community that uh, you know. It sits on the beautiful south shore of Lake Washington. It's got a great view throughout the community, but particularly, you know, that dining room of ours. Uh, we have 156 senior apartment homes offering a variety of studio, one bedroom and two bedroom floor plan options. Aero Living's, including the Lakeshore, 
operate under what jo uh, Joan was telling you about, that flex license with the state of Washington. And um, Joan explained the benefits of the flex licensing that we have, and it's proved to be a great thing in our community as well. Approximately 70% of our residents are living independently with the other 30% utilizing our assisted living services that we do offer. Should you come in as an independent uh, living resident, as Joan mentioned, down the road, if you need some assistance, the beautiful thing is that you get to stay in that apartment that you know and love so well, and you don't need to move down the hallway or to a different wing. Uh, right now, um, it's been a crazy year, as we all know. We went through several months of not moving folks into the community during the COVID restrictions that have been in place, but we have started moving uh, new residents into the commuting community, and that's been really exciting for us and the existing residents to see some new faces and new names show up in the community. We are able to do a full tour of the community, take you anywhere in the community uh, via FaceTime or Zoom or other virtual methods that might work for, for you. And But after that, if you or when you decide that the Lakeshore is the perfect place for you, uh, we can arrange a time for you to come in and uh, look at a couple apartments and pick out just the right apartment for you. And we can get you in with no problem. We are continuing to um, have folks check in at the front desk, do a temperature check and other symptom uh, questions are answered. But assuming that's all clear, we'd be happy to show you a couple apartments. A um, couple things exciting happening here at the Lakeshore that I did want to share with you. We just got word this week that uh, the Lakeshore is finally on the calendars for our residents and our staff to be able to get the COVID-19 vaccine. So uh, all residents living here, any of the staff that work here, and uh, our incoming new residents, um, if they are in by our second round of shots, they'll be eligible to get that vaccine as well. And uh, nearly 100% of our residents have chosen to get the vaccine. I think we had one that has is still in the deciding phase, but um, everybody's very excited to get it, and a large majority of our staff is as well. Um, the other thing is that if you haven't heard or if you haven't seen it in the newspaper or in other announcements that we've sent out by email, uh, we do have a very rare opportunity that um, does not take place here at the Lakeshore. And uh, currently right now we are offering a $6,000 incentive for, for move-ins. Um, anybody who makes a reservation by February 28th uh, is eligible for that, um, that $6,000 benefit. And the way that works is that after moving in, uh, new residents get $1,000 off per month for the first six full months of rent that is paid. So totaling $6,000, which is a nice little uh, benefit for folks. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about the Lakeshore, have any questions, you're interested in a tour, or if you know somebody who's interested in a tour, I know there's a couple of you on here um, today that I'm gonna be talking with to set up a time uh, for next week. I'm excited about that. But feel free, if you know somebody, if you're interested to just give the Lakeshore a call, uh, you can ask for Lisa or Alicia, myself, just ask for the community relations department and we'd be happy to set something up with you and get to know you more and figure out, um, help you figure out if this is the great, right place for you to be. So with that, I still don't see any, any questions um, in the chat. I do want to thank Joan for um, an incredibly informative presentation today. I've heard this a few times and it's great. And I learned something new every time. I took a couple notes down that I'm going to be calling my parents tonight to have them check on something in their community that they live in in Spokane. Um, but I think it's safe to say we all learned something new today and it's always a great thing. Uh, another reminder, we will be emailing all of you who participated today an evaluation form. We would really appreciate you taking the time to give your feedback on the presentation as well as any suggestions you might have for future presentations, whether it's topics or the way this is handled, anything that would make it better or easier that you might be interested in. And if you have any questions in general about the Lakeshore or a tour, again, just give us a call here at the Lakeshore. So I think we can, before we go, we'll, we'll uh, unmute the microphones. And if there's anybody on the phone or uh, on the computer and videos um, that want to ask some questions, you may do that. So go ahead and, and, and unmute yourself if you would like and, and ask away. I have a question on um, 
the two bedrooms are there is it a, a bath and a half or two baths in the two bedrooms it's how large are they? sure sure great great quite great question thank you for asking um we do have a uh, two bedroom one bath and two bedroom two full baths here at the lake shore um most of them there's very few two bedroom one baths but we do have um uh, most of the two bedrooms do have two full baths. What, there's a shower in the master bathroom and a, a tub in the in the um, second bathroom. And and size wise, you're looking at about um, 865 to eight, uh, 800, oh, eight, 862 to 873 square feet total in the two bedrooms. You Thank any, you for asking that question. Do you have any, any uh, one bedroom, one and a half baths? Uh, we don't. All of our one bedrooms do just have uh, one bathroom in them. Anybody else have any questions here? Again, feel free. Give us a call. Send us an email. We'll wrap up. Again, thank you so much to Joan. My teammates here at the Lakeshore, all of you for participating today. We love to share this information, love seeing folks, visiting with folks. I uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and your week. Um, we're looking forward to seeing you on future Zoom events and hopefully in the very near future, we'll be able to visit with you again in person. We're looking very, very forward to that day and with uh, the vaccine and the bright future ahead, we are confident that's gonna be coming very soon. So. Thank you so much for participating, everybody, and I hope you have a really great day. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Be well.